So, um, David's talked to you already this morning about message passing programming, so the concepts, why you'd want to do it, you know, to use these distributed memory machines where you want to run lots of things at once and they need to be able to do their own work and communicate with each other. And what we're going to talk about now is how you actually do it in practice. Uh, and the, the de facto standard for message passing, the thing that 99% of all large parallel programs are written in, this thing called MPI. Um, so, to understand what MPI is, I guess you really sort of need to know a little bit about what happened before MPI existed. So, um, back in the sort of late 80s, early 90s, people were making large parallel machines and selling them commercially. But, but, but you needed ways to use these machines, you needed ways to program these machines. So each of the vendors, each of the people who made these machines came up with their own library, their own way of sending messages between programs, their own message passing libraries. So you could program them, which was nice from the perspective of being able to use their machines and they probably knew how to write a library which was quite efficient for their machines. But that meant every time you bought a new machine, you had to rewrite your program. Every time you upgraded your machine or, move, or wanted to go and use someone else's machine, you had to rewrite your program. And this was a, this is a very, very hard thing to do. It, you know, the, the scientific simulation codes we use nowadays have millions of lines of codes in them. Of code in them, it's very sort of impractical, impossible, really, to rewrite them every three years just because some vendor has changed the hardware they're using, or you want to buy a different kind of machine. So. To facilitate being able to move jobs between machines and be able to write programs in a way which weren't dependent on particular machines, so the, the people who were using the machines and the people who were making the machines got together and they came up with a, a standard way of doing these kind of message passing parallel programs. So it's a MPI, is the thing they produce, a message passing interface. and, and um, David might already have told you, I think it was 20 years old this year, 20 years old, yeah. Um, MPI was the thing they came up with, and it's nothing special, it's nothing magical, it is actually just this thing here. It's just a definition of a set of routines, a set of functions, which enable you to send messages backwards and forwards. Okay, so that's what we did. The vendors came together uh, and the users came together and the users said, these are the kind of functionality we need in a message passing program. And the vendors have said, this is what hardware looks like. And then they wrote a library interface, a, a standard, which said, these are the kind of things we'll let you do. And this, this should be reasonably easy to, to implement. So MPI that we use to write these programs, it's not a programming language. It's not even a, a compiler or a tool. It's just a library. It's just a standard library which is called from a program and inside it has routines which send and receive messages and what actually goes on inside the library you don't care about. All you care about is it's, it's a standard mechanism for sending and receiving messages. Um, importantly as well, people get, sometimes get confused a little bit about MPI and um, the experience using MPI on various machines where you have a special compiler to build your MPI program and you have these, if you've ever used it before quite often you have something called MPI CC or MPI F90 to build your programs um, but actually there is no such thing as a, an MPI compiler MPI is just a library, it's just something that's called from your program quite often people who build machines give you a nice little interface, a little wrapper script which sets up the MPI library for you so you don't have to care about where the library is located and linking it into your program properly so that quite often you see a compiler which looks like it's an MPI compiler but it is just a wrapper to a normal compiler. And the programming language you use C or Fortran because 99% of the codes we use on uh, big parallel systems are written in C, C++ or Fortran. Uh, the actual programming language and the compilers you're using don't really know anything about MPI at all, just a library call to them. Okay, so it's up to the programmer to make sure they're using it correctly and it's up to the people who make the MPI library, the, generally the people who build the machines, to make sure it's implemented correctly. But, but we don't care about that. And as I said before, 
the reason that MPI was, was, was created was primarily to allow portability. So you could write your program on one machine and then take it and run it on someone else's machine entirely and it would still run and give you the correct answers. Um, the, the vendors also cared about it being efficient. So there are ways you could write a parallel message passing library which conceptually would be quite nice, but when you got down to a hardware level for people making the machines, it would be very hard to actually implement and, and um, make cheaply. So the vendors were sort of quite heavily involved in setting up a library in such a way that they could write the, the MPI library quite easily and it mapped to their hardware. But we don't really care about that. All we care about is that the vendors do write the libraries and they, they work in the same way from our point of view on any machine we run on. But of course, um, for it to be useful for people, it's also got to have um, other function, other uh, aspects to it. So MPI, the MPI library uh, from the start and, and as it's progressed, so this green book that there was a box full of over there is the MPI, the, the MPI, the version of MPI um, standard free. So we started off on version one and we're out there now um, in the middle of, of doing version four. So new functionality has been added to it. And actually in the, in the original version, in version one, there was actually about 95% of the functionality that you really, uh, that anybody ever uses for, for parallel programming. There's a couple of things which came into MPI2, which is pretty much spotted everywhere at the moment anyway, uh, such as um, function calls for IO, for write, reading and writing data in parallel and stuff like that, which weren't in the original library. And then when we go into version three and version four, there are more, more esoteric things um, that we don't, we don't really have to worry about at this level. Um, and it also offers support for heterogeneous parallel architectures. So this means that you can run a message passing program, something written with MPI, on a range of different styles of machines. So again, we don't really care about this from a user point of view, but it means that we can easily move our program between machines. How do we use it? Well, it's a library. It's a C or Fortran library or C++ library, but, but even the C++ libraries are generally written in a C-like way. Um, so it's a set of header files, which we can include in the standard way in C, it's a hash include mpi.h, and in Fortran, well, it depends what kind of, for, what flavor of Fortran you're using, but it's either an include or a, a module use statement in your program. And then inside your code, you just use it as you would any other function or subroutine calls from any other library. So in C, the function format is it's all the, all the function calls for MPI library are prefixed with MPI underscore. And then the first letter of the, the function is, is uppercase. Um, and it returns an error code. Each of the function calls return an error code, which you may or may not choose to look at. Probably most people uh, ignore these error codes. Uh, in Fortran, it's pretty much the same, except there is an explicit variable at the end of a Fortran, uh, nearly all the Fortran routines, where the error code is, is returned back to you. So we see in the Fortran versions of these um, function calls or subroutine calls are pretty much exactly the same, except for the Fortran ones have an explicit error variable at the end, which is just an integer, which has an error code in it when it's returned. The MPI library does lots of stuff inside it. Um, and there are times when you want to interact with the MPI library and ask it what's happening or ask it to give you a particular value. So it does what is, it controls its own data and it releases what they call handles to allow programmers to, to, to ask the MPI library for this data. Don't have to worry about this too much. It becomes much more clearer when we do it in, in practice. The only thing you need to note here is that these handles in Fortran are all integer types, and in C, there are specific types defined for these handles in the MPI library. And this will become clearer when we actually go and look on some of the more practical examples. <clears throat> the minimal MPI program needs two calls in it. This one here, which is, initializes the MPI library, and then there's, there's, a, there's a matching one called finalize, which 
closes down, shuts down and cleans up the MPI library. So, the, so that's a minimal MPI program. It has to have these two calls in it. Uh, MPI init um, is, is, is the initialization call. Um, in C, it can take in some uh, arguments. So it'll take in the program main arguments, uh, or you can actually specify it null, null, and it will, it will run fine like that. But it is a way of passing arguments into it. In it, in Fortran, it, it, it doesn't take any uh, arguments, but it returns a, an error value to tell you whether it's been successful or not in its initialization. Of course, you need to remember, some people get a little bit confused here, what this MPI init call is doing here is, is not creating the parallel program. It's not creating lots of parallel processes running. All it's doing is setting up the internals of the MPI library. MPI has a bunch of data structures inside it, and it's just setting up those. What David talked about at the end of the last lecture, the job launcher, that's the thing that actually runs your multiple copies of your program at once. So by the time you, you hit this MPI init, you know, if you're wanting to run on a, a program with a thousand a thousand on a thousand cores with a thousand processes run, all a thousand of those are already running, and then they get to MPI in it and they set up the MPI library so that they can send messages backwards and forwards, but they're already running. You, you have a question? Um, it's just the way it was defined. Okay. It, there, is, there is scope in the standard to pass in uh, parameters at this point to optimize some of the things like the size of the data arrays inside MPI and things like that, but it's just it's just how it was defined. And actually, so the part of the MPI two implementation is that you can pass null null in at that point, and it will work fine. And, and nearly all MPI libraries will support you just put passing null null in there. Yeah. So this is just an example of. Example in um, two examples in C of how you could run uh, MPI init and an example in Fortran. Any, any other questions? Oh, we don't do the finalize yet. So, uh, one of the, the uh, very important concepts in MPI is that of communicators. And communicators are groups of processes. So you run your program, you run it on 24 cores, you've got 24 things running, and that is a group of processes, 24 things. Um, in MPI, you can do lots of nice things with these groups of processes. You can split them up, you can sort them out, you can send messages between them, that kind of stuff. But by default, the only thing that you get when you initially run an MPI program is one communicator, one group of processes, which contains everything that's running in your parallel program. So if you run on 24 cores, you'll get a communicator which contains 24 processes in it. And this is called MPI underscore com underscore world. So this is one of the handles I talked about earlier that the MPI library gives you to interact with it. There's a special de variable defined inside the MPI library called MPI com world. And when you pass that to, to, to function calls or subroutines in the MPI library, it says, you want to do this particular operation on this group of processes, which is the group of processes that contain everybody. Okay, so everything that you do inside MPI, if you send a message backwards and forwards between two processes, or you try and find out how many processes there are, is all defined around a communicator. And the default one you get when you first start is this communicator world, which contains everybody. So in this example here, an MPI program has been run and it's been run on seven processes or seven cores. So there's seven MPI processes running. We get a group back where each of those processes are inside this MPI communicator, the com world, and they each have a particular value, a particular rank, a particular ID inside that communicator. And as I say, when the program runs, you can do nice things with the MPI library, like you could, if you want, split up this communicator and create new ones for various reasons, but you don't have to. You have a, initially you have a communicator which lets you send messages backwards and forwards and it includes everybody. So anybody inside this can send a message to anybody else. Um, no, in, sorry, yes? 
No. Because when the Empire program runs, there is, no, there is nothing outside world. There is nowhere to go. Okay, it has no concepts of anything else running on the system other than the things it knows about. So some of the later things in MPI enable you to send messages between different programs, but it's not all supported on all MPI libraries, and it's, it's, it's quite tricky to do, and it's not necessarily useful for very many programs. But there are, there are the concept of inter-communicator messages, where you could go between these things. But not, no, there isn't a... <coughs> so we saw in this example here, <coughs> we're running on seven, <coughs> seven processes inside this uh, MPI program, and they've each got a number. They've each been assigned a unique ID, a unique, what we call an MPI rank. The rank is the ID of an individual process that's running, so it can, it can differentiate itself from all the other ones that are running inside this program. And you can see here that they are numbered from zero up to the size, the number of processes we're running on minus one. And that's how MPI does it. It's, it, it numbers its, its IDs or its ranks from zero up to size minus one. Okay, so if this was, if here we were running on a thousand, um, uh, you know, a program that had a thousand processes in it on a thousand cores, we'd have IDs from zero up to 999. Okay. And a individual MPI processors running can find out what its ID is by using this routine, MPI underscore com underscore rank. And that will return to you an integer telling you what your specific ID, what your specific rank is. And you can see here that one of the arguments to this routine is this communicator. In C, it's MPI underscore com, so it's a special type that's been defined for communicators. In Fortran, it's just an integer. But this is where you can pass in MPI com world, because that's the only communicator you have when you start an MPI program. And if you pass MPI com world in here, it will tell you what this individual processor's rank is inside ID is inside that group. And they're unique, so no two processors share the same number. Yeah. Yeah, but it's because, because, so there is a, the terminology is nasty nowadays. We used to be able to say process, which is a program which is running, and processor, which is something it runs on. And nowadays you have processors with multiple cores inside it. Really, the term I should be using is process, because that's all we care about here, process, as in a running program. How that's actually mapped to the hardware, I don't really care about here, but it probably is one process is running on one core, like that. That's what most pro... But does, does MPI abstract? Um... No. So MPI just cares about running processes. Okay, so individual instances of a program that are running. It doesn't know anything about exactly how they are matched to cores on the system. Okay, now in most parallel programs, it doesn't make sense for MPI processes to share cores because you're competing for compute cycles, but there's nothing in the MPI standard which stops you doing that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess what I'm getting at is if you have three machines, each of which has eight cores, would you be running 24 MPI processes or would you be running three? You'd be running 24. Yeah, yeah, so I shouldn't use the word processor. We shouldn't use the word processor. We mean, when we say processor in here, you, you, nowadays means core. It does get a little nasty, the difference between cores, processors, processors, um, all these kind of things. So this is an example of how you, again, how you use it in C and how you use it in Fortran. Okay, you can see that we call the routine MPI com rank, pass it a communicator, which for most programs is MPI com world, and it will return a value in this variable rank here, which matches my ID and the same in, in Fortran, except note that the Fortran call has an I error variable at the end which returns the, the, the error. To be strictly accurate, there should be a, a variable here called error equals 
MPI underscore com rank because that would return us with the error there as well. But no one ever checks return values in C. So that was a way of saying, I'm an individual process running in, a, in, an, in an MPI program. What's my ID? I can also say how many processes are running all together in this MPI program. So what's the size of this MPI program? And that uses a, a routine called MPI com size. And for our example, which I had a couple of slides ago, if we ran that, if we ran MPI com size using MPI com world here, it would say seven. There are seven things running in this, this global communicator, this whole program. And likewise, if I ran on a thousand cores, then that would return a thousand to me. So it's a way of telling me how many other, how many things are running overall. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, so sort of a minimal uh, MPI program has two calls, one to initialize the MPI library, there's one at the end to finalize it. Now, all this is doing is it's nicely tidying up the memory that MPI allocated initially. Strictly speaking, you can leave this call out, right? Because when your program exits, then the memory's all tidied up anyway. But if you do leave MPI finalize off the end of your MPI program, um, it will complain to you when it exits, right? Um, and it's also, you may want to free up the memory. You may want to finish the MPI work, okay? And then do other stuff in your program. And you call MPI finalize, it will free up that memory that MPI was using, and, and you can use that inside your program. Um, so an MPI program has to have MPI in it at the beginning, and usually you put it right at the beginning of the program, but it doesn't have to be. It just has to be, for, has to be called before you do any other MPI stuff. And then MPI finalize at the end. Of course, you can do things after MPI finalize, but you can't do anything using the MPI library, otherwise it will fail because it's, it's freed up all its memory and its addresses and, and it doesn't know what's happening at that point. So MPI finalized must be the, the last procedure called. There is also a, so often people won't worry what happens if I have a, a, a bug in my program or not, not necessarily a bug, but if I get to a point in my program where it can't continue, is there a way of canceling the program cleanly? Um, MPI finalize is not the way to do that. There's a special call called MPI abort, which will actually signal all the other pro processes that you're running in this MPI program and tell them to finish because uh, something, something's gone wrong. Um, actually, it's very rare you would have to use this. There's not many bits of code you construct, construct where you really physically have to abort the program and no one else would know about it. But if you do need to do this, there is a code where there is a call where you can run MPI abort on one process and it will kill the rest of them cleanly and shut your program down. Okay. It's a strange routine is this because it is, it breaks MPI in some respects because it's a collective, it's a routine which has a collective outcome. It affects everybody else, but you only have to call it on one process to work. All the other collective routines in, in MPI, everybody has to call it, otherwise it doesn't work properly. This one, um, you can just call it on one process and it will abort them all. Um, you should still obviously still call MPI finalize after this as well to clean it up. But uh, on the programs where they didn't call abort and they've been aborted remotely, then, then you can't do this. It is possible. Um, so, well, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly go over this, but most people don't need to care about it. It is possible to, 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 to get the host name, the name of the actual processor and core and server that you're running on from an MPI, inside MPI. Now, you can actually do this just with a system call from C or Fortran to, to various uh, routines, but, but MPI gives you a way of doing this, and it's a routine called MPI get processor name. Uh, and in this context, processor here means whatever your MPI process is running on. So it could mean core, it could mean a processor. It, it, it's a, um, a little woolly terminology. But so if you care about exactly which machine your program is running on, and most programs 90, and you know, I've never, I've never seen, I've rarely seen a program which actually has to know which 
which actual core or processor or server it's running on to do anything useful. But if you do care about that or if you're trying to do some debugging and work out what's going wrong, there is a routine which will give you that data. So that's the, the basics of how you use MPI. Of course, we haven't talked there at all about sending messages or receiving messages or reading and writing data or anything like that. But you can write a minimal MPI program there. You can initialize it. You can find out what your ID or rank is. You can find out how many processes, processes there are in the program. And you can finish it. And actually, there are some programs uh, like task farms where you don't need to send data to, com to communicate, to send messages. You just want to do something different inside each version of a program that's running based on the ID. So you say, my ID is three, that means read this particular file and work on it. And this guy over here, his ID is four, so he's going to read a different file. So you can write a perfectly acceptable parallel program using this functionality and not sending messages backwards and forwards. Um, sometimes called embarrassingly parallel programs because they don't involve any communication. 